Hello, uh, I'm Tammy Seneca, Supervisor of Information Systems and Educational Technology for West Baton Rouge Parish Schools. And in this session, we're going to talk about uh, Hattie's research in the classroom and how um, I have helped to connect some of this with technology in our district. Uh, so we're just referring to John Hattie and his work on visible learning. Um, here are a couple of resource guides or resource books that I've used. Uh, this is a really good one, Visible Learning uh, for Teachers by John Hattie, which is included in um, this uh, presentation with some of the information. Also, uh, you can get the actual information with all of his research studies. And then there's specific books like this, where they have visible learning in science, math, they have it for ELA. Um, there is also references in this presentation, so you can get all of the, uh, the, the studies and all the information that you might need without having to actually purchase those books. So let's go ahead and get started. So one thing that I always like to show when I get started talking about some of these uh, topics with our teachers is this video from John Silva called uh, uh, Shots of Awe. And so I'm going to just stop for a second and get us started off by this idea of we have a responsibility to all in our classrooms. We have a responsibility to our students. So I'm going to go ahead and play this and then we'll kind of talk about it on the other end. So I think a lot about the contrast between banality and wonder, between disengagement and radiant ecstasy, between being unaffected by the here and now, and being absolutely ravished emotionally. And I think one of the problems for human beings is mental habits. Once we create a comfort zone, we rarely step outside of that comfort zone. But the consequence of that is a phenomenon known as hedonic adaptation. Overstimulation to the same kind of thing, the same stimuli again and again and again, renders said stimuli invisible. Your brain has already mapped it in its own head, and you no longer literally have to be engaged by that. We have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. There's a great book called The Wondering Brain that says that one of the ways that we elicit wonder is by scrambling the self temporarily so that the world can seep in. And as Henry Miller says, even a blade of grass, when given proper attention, becomes an infinitely magnificent world in itself. You know, Darwin said attention is sudden and close, graduates into surprise, and this into astonishment, and this into stupefied amazement. That's what rapture is. That's what illumination is. That's what that sort of infinite comprehending awe that human beings love so much. And so how do we do that? How do we mess with our perceptual apparatus in order to have the kind of emotional and aesthetic experience from life that we render most meaningful? Because we all know those moments are there. Those are the moments that we make final cut. Only in these moments we experience a fresh hardly bearable ecstasy of direct energy exploding on our nerve endings. This is the rhapsodic, ecstatic, bursting forth of awe that expands our perceptual parameters beyond all previous limits, and we literally have to reconfigure our mental models of the world in order to assimilate the beauty of that download. That is what it means to be inspired. The Greek root of the term means to breathe in, to take it in. We fit the universe through our brains and it comes out in the form of nothing less than poetry. We have a responsibility to awe. So in a classroom, what exactly does that mean that we have a responsibility to awe? What is that? refer to and how we do our daily practices. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that we do have to present our, our students with materials and content and activities that are really um, challenging them and making them think. And this is where they're going to end up 
creating those uh, thought processes that are becoming enduring forms of understanding. So I encourage you to go back and watch this video again. Here's the reference to it on YouTube. I watch it quite often uh, because I think it does kind of inspire me in terms of remembering why we do what we do in order to kind of um, really bring that all back into our classrooms and into our schools. So uh, to do that, one thing I think we need to do is understand the research. And here's uh, the reference to several of the books that I just sort of started with at the beginning of this session. And if you look, uh, this visible learning one here is all the actual meta-analysis that he reviewed, but also in this visible learning book at the very, very back, you're going to find the actual reports uh, are in terms of all the effect sizes, the name of the report, when the report was done, uh, what the mean averages was. You can really get into a lot of information if you would like to. They're all referenced here in this actual document as well as in that visible learning. Uh, book that is the synthesis of uh, the 800 meta-analysis. I will say that this book here is a little bit um, meatier, uh, a little tougher to read. This one is a great breakdown as well as these other ones because they actually break it down into more of what we would look like and what we would see in a classroom. So let's kind of dig in a little bit. So we need to first of all begin as we start talking about uh, Hattie's research and how it can help us in the classroom with that idea of how are we making a, a, any type of a systematic positive impact on kids. So we know we want to try to, be, to get a, a year of learning out of our students. That is so important now with COVID, with everything going on, students' lives are upended. So this is a great way to kind of tap into some research that's out there that we know are really good positive teaching strategies. Um, I, but I think the most important thing that I want to try to stress in this session is this next statement to, by Caddy that the biggest impact is the teacher and their expertise, especially the ones that work together collaboratively. So the the biggest thing you can have you can have 800 meta analysis uh research documents but if the teacher is not the main person who is actually um the driver of this then i think that's going to be where you fall short so keep that in mind as you dig into some of these research articles uh, so the easiest way to look at Hattie's research and how he did it was to look at the effect size. So basically the effect size is the magnitude or the size of the giving of, given effect, whichever research you're dealing with. So what you need to understand is how does that effect size work in terms of what is a positive effect, what is a medium effect, what is a low effect, and what is a negative effect. So if we look at his barometer of influence, you're going to see that one year's growth is going to fall around 0.4 tenths. So if you are looking at um, a research study and looking at the effect size, for example, this is feedback, which has an effect size of 0.75. Well, that means it's over 0.4 which means that would be one year of average growth, you would see. But also it falls into this zone of a desired effect in terms of where you would see major growth, where you would see a whole lot of growth. So notice 75 is going to fit. This is where uh, feedback falls between 0.7 and 0.8, basically between considered excellent and major growth. Anything that falls between 0.2 and 0.4 is considered average, medium effect. Uh, anything that falls between 0 and 0.2 is going to be a low effect. And then, of course, anything under that would be a negative effect. So it's important to understand when you're looking at your um, different things that you're doing in your classroom, are they making a difference in terms of their strategies? Because... You could be doing something over and over and over and over again, but it has a very low effect size, which means you're not going to see any that much growth in your students as a result of that strategy. So here's a good little quick breakdown for you. 
the difference between high influence, medium, low, and negative influence. I just have that on there for you as a quick reference because it's easy to get a little confused with the numbers, but this is a great way to kind of break it down. So let's talk about what that means. So here are some examples of some different um, teaching strategies, teaching styles, um, and some programs, if you want to call it a program, as you can see, they're labeled programs here, but where they fall in terms of the effect size. So as you can see, anything here low would be considered a low influence. Typical influence would be medium, like we discussed earlier, and then high impact. Remember, we're trying to get to the point where they're doing at least one year of um, growth there, and it's making a difference. So notice what we're seeing here. Whole language programs have a low effect size, whereas visual perception programs, phonics programs, vocabulary programs, and repeated reading have a high impact. Down here in the corner, and you'll be provided with this um, slide deck, is the link to an article where this uh, image came from that will give you a little bit more information if you want to dig into it a little bit more. But here's a good example of looking at um, effect sizes. So what if you have an, your teacher that's doing more active learning or teaching, and then if you have your teachers that are just basically doing more simulation. So notice the difference here. So your activator is looking at reciprocal teaching, feedback, teaching students self-verbalization, goal setting. Um, and notice how high all of these effect sizes are. Whereas if we look over here, some of the things we hear a lot about, simulations and gaming, uh, inquiry-based teaching, uh, smaller class sizes, look at smaller class sizes, the effect size on it. Uh, teaching different um, for boys and girls. Note, look at the, there's not, there's, it's low. It's a low influence. So what ends up happening and, and what I noticed happened to me as I started looking at some of these visual learning um, actual studies and the effect sizes is we end up coming up with ideas in our head of what we think makes a difference with students. And sometimes there's not the data to back it up. So I think that's what's so great about John Hattie's work is John Hattie actually took the science and looked at the math, crunched the numbers and found the effect sizes so that you could look to see what would be some of your greatest impacts uh, to learning. And I think feedback is one that we often neglect but obviously has a high effect size. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, mention to you is if you go to Hattie's website and if you click actually on uh, where it says access article here, you're going to find the 252 influences and effect sizes related to student achievement based on Hattie's book and Hattie's research. This is Hattie's website. There's a bunch of great things on this website, so make sure to check it out. But I love... Uh, this actual uh, diagram because as you break down and look at the diagram it breaks down the effect sizes so look how how uh, much influence the jigsaw method has 1.2 is that effect size Piaget programs 1.28 but then if you go scrolling on down here looking at even more and it gets lower and lower look at this parental employment, uh, multi-grade uh, age classes, even breastfeeding. So it goes through and even shows you some of the negative effects. Look at ADHD. So as low influences, because it's all really about what you as the teacher are doing and presenting to your students in the class. So that's the big question. What is your impact as a teacher? This is one of my absolute favorite videos. I watch it every year at the beginning of the year. Rita Pearson was a gift to education. Um, right here, you'll find the full seven minute, but we're gonna show just a, I'm gonna just show a small clip, about two, two and a half minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. And I want you to really listen to what Rita Pearson is saying here. We know 
know why kids don't learn. It's either poverty, low attendance, negative peer influences. We know why. But one of the things that we never discuss or we rarely discuss is the value and importance of human connection. Relationship. James Comer says that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. George Washington Carver says all learning is understanding relationships. Everyone in this room has been affected by a teacher or an adult. For years, I have watched people teach. I have looked at the best and I've looked at some of the worst. A colleague said to me one time, they don't pay me to like the kids. They pay me to teach a lesson. The kids should learn it. I should teach it. They should learn it. Case closed. Well, I said to her, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. <laughs> Can we stand to have more relationships? Absolutely. Will you like all your children? Of course not. And you know your toughest kids are never absent. <laughs> never. You won't like them all, and, and, and the, the, the tough ones show up for a reason. It's the connection. It's the relationships. And while you won't like them all, the key is they can never, ever know. So teachers become great actors and great actresses, and we come to work when we don't feel like it, and we listen to policy that doesn't make sense, and we teach anyway. We teach anyway, because that's what we do. Teaching and learning should bring joy. How powerful would our world be if we had kids who, who were not afraid to take risks, who were not afraid to think, and who had a champion every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Is this job tough? You betcha. Oh God, you betcha. But it is not impossible. We can do this. We're educated. We're born to make a difference. Thank you so much. So I just want to reiterate that this this is this hits me every time I watch it and every time I hear her say it. Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists they become the best they can possibly be. So think about some of those things we just briefly looked at in terms of John Hattie and think about what we talked about of how you as a teacher can influence your kids. And it's so true, we all had that one teacher. We all had that one educator that we still think fondly of. When, and, and we think of ourselves and what we've actually given back to our own students. And so keep that in mind as, we, as you start to think about Hattie and you start to think about how you can apply some of those concepts in terms of in your classroom every day with not just technology, but with other, with everything. So this was, a, I thought, was a great thing to just sort of give you a feel for uh, what Hattie looks at in his visual, visual, visible, excuse me, learning research is the six sign point, uh, signposts from the, his research for excellence in education. And notice how much of it is so much teacher driven. Number one, teachers are among the most powerful influences in learning. People can make policies all day long. But unless you have that teacher in the classroom that knows what, he, what they are doing, he or she is doing, then you will not have success in education. The other thing, the teachers have to be directive, influenced, and caring. They have to passionately engage with their kids. The kids need to know that they're there for them. They need to be aware of every student and what they're thinking, how to construct those those uh, lessons that are meaningful and that are that is proficient in terms of the knowledge that they know and most importantly that is providing some feedback to the students the students need to know and a feedback not meaning you made an a b c d or f what kind of feedback are you giving them about the, the knowledge that they are obtaining that knowledge that you are presenting them 
Number four, teachers and students need to know the learning intentions and the criteria for student success for their lessons. You need to know, begin with the end in mind, backwards design. What do you want the kids to know? What do the kids need to know? And they need to be able to say that they, they need to know when this is all said and done when you have taught them everything. Number five, uh, teachers need to move from the single idea to multiple ideas. We need to teach our kids how to think. It's not knowledge or ideas, but the learner's construction of their knowledge and ideas that is critical. So it's them actually creating their knowledge, interacting with their content, understanding what they're learning. And when I say interact with their content, that doesn't mean read chapter three and answer the odd number questions at the end of the chapter because the even numbers have the answers in the back of the book. How are they actually interacting with that, that, that information that you're presenting? And then the last one on here, it's okay to make a mistake. So if they make a mistake or they bomb a test, what are you doing to help those students? How are we making sure that the students are relearning that information? How do they, how are they feeling in your class to make sure that they know it's okay to make a mistake? They don't have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. And I can tell you personally, some of the biggest lessons I've had in life is when I had failures and what I learned and picked myself up from and move forward from. We have to teach kids that it's okay to fail as long as we're failing forward, as long as we're learning what we're failing from. So know what your impact is. The biggest uh, message from Visible Learning is not another recipe for success. So I'm going to tell you right now, it's not a taxonomy. It's not a program. It's none of that. It is just good research and how it affects our students. So the message is not another recipe for success, another quest for certainty, another unmasking of truth. There is no recipe no professional development set of worksheets, no new teaching method, and no Band-Aid remedy. It is a way of thinking. My role as a teacher is to evaluate the effect I have on my students. It is to know thy impact. It is to understand this impact, and it is to act on this knowing and understanding it. So if you want to really dig into this and you don't want to spend a bunch of money on these books, click right here. And this is a great overview of how to understand visible learning and your impact on education. And it really breaks everything down. It goes into a lot of detail, a lot more detail than what's obviously in this um, short uh, presentation. But it also gives you exercises to do so you'll understand everything and then how to start kind of putting it into practice. Great resource. Uh, I highly recommend it for you to take a look at. So what do we want? How do we apply that in today's world, especially with technology and everything else? I thought this is a great little video to kind of give us the idea of where we need to be going with that. Imagine the awesomest thing you can, like an automatic grilled cheese maker or a time machine or a time machine with an automatic grilled cheese maker. Now imagine who's going to invent it. Him? Glasses here? Whoever they are? Or maybe her? But how do kids like these become the types of people that do things like this? Maybe we should ask this guy. Knowledge is happy. Sometimes it's a limit to, to have new ideas. That's the problem with the old schooling because they were teaching answers. I believe questions are probably more important today than the answers. Erno's cube is a question waiting to be answered. And when the right person finds the right question, something amazing happens. They start seeing the world as it truly is. Not a place to be memorized, but a place to be figured out, flipped, turned, twisted, and ultimately made better forever. Today, she may be an octopus, but help kids like her fall in love with problem solving, and they will embark on journeys to become scientists, artists, engineers, designers, inventors, or something no one's ever been before, but you can bet we're going to need.
That's why moments like this, go, and this, and this, and especially this, are so important. Because there are companies to found, planets to walk on, time machines to invent, a future to be made amazing. We may not know what it's going to look like, but we know who's going to do it. So think about that as we start looking at some technology examples. Technology is a great way to get our students excited about learning, as long as we're not doing technology for technology's sake. So the following is a bunch of examples that we've kind of worked on here in West Baton Rouge. We have a whole lot more. So if you're more interested, if you're interested in that, you can always go to our website, uh, wbrschools.net, and then look under technology department, and you'll see a bunch of this stuff on there. Um, also, I have a lot more information and other examples. You can always email me. My email is going to be at the end of this presentation, and I, I'm more than willing to share any of that with you because, look, we're all in this together. So think about that idea of who's going to be the next person who's that, that could be sitting in your class, the person who is going to create, is going to find the cure for cancer, who's going to actually figure out a way for us to live on Mars. So let's talk about a couple of examples. Breakout EDU is a great example of a way to get the kids to start thinking really critically and collaboratively. So I, I, if you, this has been around a while. There's still a bunch of free breakouts that you can get to on Breakout EDU. There's also a lot of online breakouts that you can do for your remote learning students. But I really encourage you to look at Breakout EDU. Um, also, um, if you look at this link here, it'll take you there uh, to these different lesson plans or activities. These are some great ones that you can find online for free from Breakout EDU. Uh, another thing we like to use is things like drones. Like, for example, I love this is one of my favorite pictures. These are our students a couple years ago, and they were actually doing, uh, we did drone quidditch with them after they, this was the reading group, um, and they the, are the book club, and they actually uh, read about uh, read Harry Potter, and then we had several games we played with them. LSU Quidditch came out. We did drone Quidditch. We also have lesson plans that are a little bit more serious, like drones and warfare. If you click here, um, you're going to find all the information and all of the lesson plan there for these. Um, the concept here is that you can see the looks on these kids' faces about dealing with drones, but then we can actually bring in some really mindful and good discussions and activities for that. Uh, this is another activity we've done with drones and iRovers. Uh, here's one that I created, the search for the Infinity Stone. All of it is here for you. Everything's here for you to break, uh, to, uh, to use, to give you an idea of what this is. The students were, uh, were broken up, this engineering students, and they were broken up into groups of um, those that were flying a drone and those that were actually using these iRovers. That costs, I think, around a hundred bucks or so, eighty bucks on Amazon. And so, what they had to do was, it was sort of like taking Breakout Edu. So they had clues that they had to find and then go on the on the actual uh, flight area or the rover area and go ret uh, retrieve the Infinity Stones. So once they figured out where the Infinity Stones were, they had to go find their uh, clues and bring them back. So much fun. Kids loved it. It was great activity. Uh, things like the Lego Coding Express. Uh, Lego Coding Express is great for like we use it with Head Start, uh, kindergarten, pre-K, those students. Uh, there's a teacher's guide available with a bunch of lessons. And basically the train, the, in the, the, you see these color tabs will have the train go a certain way backwards, forwards. It's a great way to get them to start programming and thinking. We use a lot with 3D printing. Uh, here's an example of an economics lesson where the kids actually uh, had to design a, on Tinkercad a bubble wand 
and then they have to try to figure out how much it would cost them um, to set to create to not only make them but to also try to sell them after they actually printed these out. Um, great activity. Teachers love them. Kids love it. That's another one. Uh, th here's another 3D printing one. Um, this is actually a lesson about what was found in Abraham Lincoln's pockets on the day that he was assassinated. And basically we used a 3D printer in this case to bring the actual death mask, which we found online and downloaded and printed. And then it gave it a more uh, kind of tactile uh, view of um, Abraham Lincoln, kind of brought things to life a little bit more, but there were some really great discussions about why he had some of these things in his pocket. One of them being a Confederate dollar, which I thought was interesting. Bloxels is another great one. Both of these are lesson plans for uh, that you are more than willing uh, or more than welcome to use. Bloxels are great because as you can see here, the kids design on this tray, their backgrounds, their, um, their, their characters, all of that type of stuff. They, they design all of it and then put it and scan it into their Galaxy tablet, iPad, or whatever you want to use. And then they kind of work it out, act it out. Uh, in this case, they had to build ecosystems, um, those types of things. BeeBots is another good one for uh, very, very young kids. We use these a lot for programming for kids in terms of direction for um, the pre-K Head Start elementary kids. You can see they move back and forward. The kids have to actually uh, program them to move. And our teachers love using these. We have a lot of uh, programming cards, activities here, and some other things that our teachers have put together that you're, that you're more than willing to use or, or more than able to use. Spheros are another good one we love. Uh, this is a great activity where we have the kids going through um, the different um, navigation trade for, for fifth graders for the uh, slave trade. And it talks about, it goes through mapping and programming with the kids. Uh, all of the materials are provided here for you. And the kids actually had to program their spheros to actually go along the certain different paths. Uh, we love stop, uh, stop motion animation. These are also really good ways for kids to uh, create. Not only the smaller kids, like with this one here on the make and take uh, for this stop motion. This was a, a, a good one for, I think it was uh, uh, pre-K kids, I believe. Uh, the Waves is fourth grade, so it talks more about... Um, investigating waves and sound and all that type of stuff. Everything is laid out on these. We also have some we've done for um, natural disasters that you're more than welcome. If, if you're interested in, just reach out to us and we'll tell you where those are at. Flipgrid is another activity that we do a lot uh, with. Uh, it's a great way to let kids talk. It's a great way to have kids communicate back and forth with each other. Make sure to check out Flipgrid. There's some examples here if you'd like to look at them. But in Flipgrid, it's also a great way for kids to communicate, your ELL students, uh, things like that. Google Expeditions, break down the walls of your uh, classroom. Here's an activity on biomimicry. Um, all set up for you and done. This was third grade. Kids absolutely love this activity. Uh, so they part of the activity was them actually going on a um, virtual field trip, but then they ex ex it's extended out to do other activities and to do a more extensive uh, look at the problem. Presentation software is always a great thing to use and to do. Uh, this is one of my favorites from sixth grade we did in conjunction with the museum in Baton Rouge, the LESC museum. And basically the kids are having to study the ancient river civilizations of, of you can see Mesopotamia, Egypt, Indus Valley, and China. And then they have to try to design a, um, 
a display for the museum. And then as a, as a class, they pick which ones they feel should be in the museum. So with all of that said, I think it's a great, this, hopefully this presentation has you thinking differently. So I'm going to uh, sort of end it on this little video here. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. It is the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So I challenge you to think differently. I challenge you to look at your students who are thinking differently and challenge your students to think differently. And I'll say, just like Rita said, this isn't an easy thing. This isn't, teaching is not easy, but we can do this. We're educators. We were born to make a difference. You make a difference every day. And I thank you for your time. Please reach out if you have any questions or would like to, uh, any more um, information on some of the materials we have. And uh, thanks for joining.